This is Namitha Satmotha for NAJM Catalyst. I'm speaking today with Dr. David Blumenthal, President of the Commonwealth Fund, and Dr. Robert Galvin, Operating Partner at the Blackstone Group and Chief Executive Officer of Equity Healthcare, which manages healthcare for over 75 employers. Both these executives have had extensive experience and positive impact in all of the sectors that compromise our complex healthcare ecosystem. Bob and David, we are delighted to have you joining us today to discuss one of those sectors, the private sector, and its growing commitment to and investment in healthcare delivery in order to address rising costs and inefficiencies in the system. Let's start by level setting. Private sector is an incredibly broad term. How do each of you define private sector, and what are the key drivers motivating these players to act now? I, I think of the private sector as the investor-owned or for-profit side of the delivery system, but even in this context, much more uh, about a new flock or a new crop of organizations that have not traditionally been in healthcare, at least on the delivery side, and have entered recently with the uh, intention of dramatically changing how healthcare is delivered, or at least the expressed uh, goal of dramatically changing how healthcare is delivered. I think we're talking about large companies like uh, Amazon and Google and J.P. Morgan and others that that buy healthcare in large amounts um, and have disrupted other industries, and now see opportunities to do that to change the healthcare delivery system. You know, to me, I would agree. I the only uh, I would add that it's helpful to think of payers. So, for example, health insurance companies and employers, uh, you know, versus Medicare, Medicaid as private sector, and then the the providers or service delivery companies like the ones that David mentioned, because there's innovations on each side of the private sector. What what I don't think we're talking about, for the most part, are the big nonprofit private systems that have traditionally dominated healthcare at least in the major urban areas. And the, though they are getting bigger and more powerful, many of them, uh, they are not the private sector actors that we have been talking about and writing about. What are the key drivers motivating these players to act now? Sure, I can take that one. Look, I think on the payer side, a costs just keep going up and without evidence that outcomes are getting better at the same time. So if you're an employer uh, in trying to pay for health care and, and stay profitable as a company, you're really challenged. And I think that drives change. And I think if you're an Amazon, a Google, an Apple, as David mentioned, you see opportunity. You see the biggest sector in the economy that continues to grow. You see a lot of unhappiness, whether it's the payers, as I mentioned, or patients uh, and consumers who are unhappy, and you just see a lot of possible profits and the ability to do well and to do good. Where a lot of the money is, and if you are a disruptor, and I think that the Silicon Valley mentality creates a feeling that smart people with, with new technology and new ideas can disrupt just about any sector. Uh, healthcare looks like it's pretty ripe. But I think there is a mission element to this. I think David is right. I think when you're out in Silicon Valley and talking to either the investors or the entrepreneurs, look what they've done to retail. They've done to transportation. Look what they've done to sectors that it seemed banking, impossible to change. And I do think they look at healthcare and see it uh, and see it ripe, just as David said. Let's get a level a level deeper by talking about some specific details. What are some examples of these creative and innovative things that these types of organizations are doing? And are any of them mature enough yet to actually have demonstrated meaningful impact? David, I don't mind taking that just because I'm on the sector side. And so, no, I think the answer to the second question is it is really too early. And I think it's so important to de-hype this because there's an idea a minute, there's a lot of money to be invested. Uh, so the investment capital going into this is immense, 
and that just drives so many stories that you would think things have transformed more than they are. But I think, you know, examples are, you know, kind of the Apple Watch and how they're moving into doing EKGs and people are measuring kind of how much they exercise. They're able to monitor their sleep now. Soon their EEGs is an example of a disruptor. I think telehealth is an example. Just this week, Amazon's Alexa, it was announced that they are getting really into the health game, and it was actually the National Health Service in the UK that signed a deal with them so that for citizens of the UK, they're going to be able to ask Amazon questions like, how do I treat my migraine headache? And do I have a urinary tract infection? So I think those are examples of kind of how things are being disrupted. There's another example that I would give that tracks the area where I spent part of my life in the Obama administration, and that is that Apple now has agreements with hundreds of hospitals and healthcare providers to download electronic health records from those providers with patient permission onto the mobile devices that consumers and patients carry around with them so that if they want access to their records, they don't have to go through a patient portal. They, they can have the whole thing uh, available to them as easily as the information about the weather or when their flight is taking off. What are some unintended consequences of these types of initiatives or technologies? It sounds great. You talked, Bob, about wanting to de-hype some things. Let's pause and think about what some of the potential unintended consequences are of, of introducing these types of things to the market. Yeah, sometimes I think the unintended consequences exceed the benefits, to be honest. <laughs> when you get into a system as big as healthcare, as resistant to change in healthcare, and inherently so much more complicated. This is really not buying goods and services over Amazon. This is not getting an Uber or using Lyft. Uh, these are, in many cases, very sick people with complicated diseases in a system that's already uh, kind of very complicated. So one unintended consequence is you just make it more complicated for people. <laughs> oh, so now the number of choices they have and, and kind of the array of uh, kind of opportunities they have to access these apps can be overwhelming. I think the misinformation is uh, another uh, unintended consequence. I'm not sure how good Alexa is going to be or, you know, whether there's going to be any clinical judgment in Alexa. So if you now go on to the web and look for healthcare information, it's as likely to be inaccurate as it is to be accurate. As a longtime primary care physician, I have another concern, and that is that it's going to fracture relationships between sort of anchor clinicians, whether they're physicians or nurses, uh, sources of primary care, and patients, uh, and create confusion about where to go for care and maybe even reduce primary care clinicians' sense of responsibility for the management of patients since there will be potentially so many other sources of uh, contact with the healthcare system. One place I would probably disagree with David. I don't disagree with them that it is something that might happen. I disagree, and I am a primary care physician and uh, a proud one, uh, but when I look at how people want to access care, uh, and if you look at this from a, quote, consumer point of view, they don't necessarily want to try and reach a, a primary care doctor who might not call them back or they have to wait, uh, uh, you know, a certain amount of time for an appointment. They want immediate access. And so whether it's these convenience clinics that came up, whether they can do it from their phone uh, and soon their watch to get an answer, I think it's serving what they want. Now, I'm talk not talking about, you know, the small percent of very sick people. I'm talking about the big percent of people that have everyday health care concerns. And so I worry about primary care, again, as a primary care physician, because I think the mode of delivery isn't consistent with what people want in today's kind of very connected, fast-paced world. Well, the 5% the of patients who account for 50% of expenditures need 
continuous longitudinal care, comprehensive care, and care that's knowledgeable about their complicated problems. Their simple problems are often complicated by their uh, other conditions. So uh, it's very hard to imagine solving our major health care issues, especially around cost, without developing effective systems for caring for that 5%. That's where the money is. Uh, and it's actually also where many of our quality and safety problems are uh, because those are the patients who are in constant contact with our healthcare system. Yeah, look, here I agree with you. I, I think that for that 5%, I don't think on the delivery side, I don't see much gain from this tech. But that means 95% of the population might not have their service needs met in a system that serves the five. So I see it atomizing, and I see all this investment capital and all the kind of uh, uptake, you know, by individuals as, as they go into these convenience clinics and increasingly use telehealth to be a sign of that. So I do worry, like you do, David, that the 5% are really, from a physician's point of view, the most important because they are ill. They do need coordination. They need primary care uh, physicians. But I don't think a system that doesn't well serve the other 95% is not going to get disrupted. The, the best kinds of uh, conversations are, are those where we integrate many different perspectives out of which we will we'll find a, a path forward as we, as we continue to do and as you, Bob and David, are both leading and, and shaping the, the conversation and, uh, and the structure of our future healthcare delivery system and and beyond that our, our larger healthcare ecosystem. Thank you so much for speaking with NEJM Catalyst today. We appreciate it. Thanks for talking with us, Norman. Good and thank you.